I think what really turned on the light was learning about soil, about how to take care of the soil. I think it really is all about the soil. If you can, if you can take care of the soil, the soil will grow the grass, and then the grass will grow the cattle, and mm-hmm. cattle will feed people, and and it's all about the soil and the and the sun and the rain. In this episode of Voices from the Field, we get acquainted with Dr. Tina Cohn, a retired veterinarian living in Berryville, Arkansas. Tina has a conversation with NCAT livestock specialist Linda Coffey about the life she lives now in her second career, raising beef cattle and practicing regenerative grazing. Tina says she loves what she does and describes the family business and the joys and challenges of running a large cattle operation in the rugged terrain of the Ozarks. She talks about the satisfaction of seeing soil and pastures and cattle improve. She talks about the satisfaction of seeing soil and pastures and cattle improve and of children coming home to live. Let's listen. This is Linda Coffey with NCAT Southeast, and I'm very happy to be here today with Dr. Tina Cohn, DVM. Tina is a cattle rancher in Arkansas who was super helpful with our Women Livestock in the Land training and has been a mentor to many, and I've enjoyed visiting her farm myself, and I thought it would be good to just have a conversation with Tina and um, let you enjoy her story as well. So, Tina, thank you for being here. Well, I'm happy to happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, yeah. Um, can you tell about your career path? Yes, I uh, am a veterinarian. I went to Vet school at the University of Missouri, um, graduated in 1981, met my husband there. He's also a vet, and uh, after a a stint in in Bolivar, Missouri, we wound up in my hometown of Berryville, Arkansas, and we started a practice there in 1982, and it it started real small, um, just you know, tiny little clinic, and we lived at the clinic for a year and a half until we could afford to rent another place. It, so we we had pretty meager beginnings, and uh, we also had uh, my mom let us use a little bit of her land, and so we had about ten head of cattle. And so through the years, we grew the practice and had ultimately um, another clinic in Green Forest, and then a satellite clinic in Shelma, Missouri and had quite a few employees and and other veterinarians that worked with us. And at the same time, we grew our farming operation. We acquired land and and more cattle. And so through the years, we we worked on on both of those those things. In 2004, we sold two of the practices. And um, I continued to work at the vet clinic and then Alan had an ambulatory large animal practice and then uh, took took care of the cattle. Uh, we always had a separation of duties. Alan took care of the, the cattle operation and I, I managed the vet clinics and uh, he would help me when I needed help and I would also help on the farm. We, we uh, worked always weekends and holidays and after hours, particularly in the summer, were always spent just working on the farm. That's that was what we enjoyed doing, and so it was like our avocation. But now that we've retired from veterinary practice, more or less, it's become uh, a, vo- a vocation. So, uh, and actually, we're we're living our dream. We both uh, enjoy taking care of the land and the cattle. The veterinary profession was was wonderful. It was good to us, but this is in relation to that practice this is so peaceful and calm <laughs> so compared, peaceful. To, compared to uh running running a mixed animal practice in rural arkansas oh i can just think about the fast pace and the long <laughs> hours and uh really take my hat off to you for doing that i know we need more veterinarians doing large animals all over the country now so uh I thank you for for your work there and i can I can just about imagine what the nights and weekends and holidays were like as you tried to build up your farm. So at some point, your husband stopped doing the vet work and was just doing the farm. Is that right? Um, when we sold the practice, they they just bought the small animal portion oh. of it. So 
Alan continued to just, uh, he had just a select group of large animal clients and he, he continued to, to do work for them for a while, but he's, he's sort of phased out of that now. And he mostly just takes care of the cattle and he has some other, other side gigs too, but, but that's what he likes. So, so tell, so let's talk about the farm that you and your husband and son manage now. Like, can you describe where and what it's like, like the scale that you're working at now. Okay. Our older son, Matt, Matt Honeycutt, is involved in the cattle operation with us. He has his own herd of cattle. He his his story's pretty interesting too, the way he got involved in cattle, but but he has a his own herd and Alan and I have our herd of cattle and we have land that we own, land we lease, land Matt owns, man land Matt leases, so we have the herds are commingled and, and it's it's kind of convoluted and complicated, but our farms are, I guess you'd say farm, but it's just an op- our operation is in uh, Carroll County, Arkansas, which is northwest Arkansas. That's in the, uh, in the Ozark Mountains. We are mostly south of Berryville, about six miles south of Berryville is our, our main farm. The Ozarks, if you've never been there, they're, it's very beautiful, but rugged, rough, rocky, hilly, uh, bluffs, caves. Uh, there's some beautiful farmland too. I mean, not, not farmland that you could row crop really, but, but it does grow really good grass. It's, I think it's excellent area to raise cattle because, uh, you know, if you take care of the, of the soil, you can grow lots of forage. And so it's, it's, uh, it's, but it's not your standard place. It's a little challenging to, to build fence and to, operate any kind of equipment there but but we love it it's beautiful and and it's it's productive for us for for our use now having been on your farm a couple years ago i think grazing livestock is the very best use for that land and i would be afraid to drive a tractor down some of those (laughs) those slopes so yeah so so how do you manage the land and you haven't said yet how many head of cattle combined are you all Oh, it, it varies so much, but mm-hmm. um, probably between a thousand and twelve hundred head, mm-hmm. and that would include baby baby calves too. But that that would be approximately. It's it, it changes so much. We don't we don't count them anymore. We used to have them named, but anymore <laughs> they we, they do have numbered ear tags, but uh, but we we don't have a complete count, it, and it, it it really doesn't matter because they're. We manage them as herds, not as individuals. Right. So right. Um, the more you have that, the the less you don't look at them as much as in, as individuals as you do as a herd. You manage the herd, and and that was an interesting concept to get used to too. But Matt also told me not not to have a favorite. Don't have a favorite because <laughs> something happens to the favorite. So I I've, I've learned not to have a favorite because he's right. You don't want to have any any particular favorites. So. So you manage your the way the way the your family does this. You were saying Matt's herd and 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 you and Alan have a herd, but they're not in separate groups. You you you're grupping them based on what? On um, the classification of animal mm-hmm. is the way we group them. Um, and we we have different colored ear ear tags um, so that Matt's cattle don't have yellow tags. Ours have red. He'll put a little ear notch in his calves when they're born so that if they lose a tag, he knows there he is. And so we, we keep them separately identified. And so when he sells cattle, he gets the money for his cattle mm-hmm. and we get the money for our cattle. And the expenses are, are shared e- equally. I mean, we try to, it's, it, it, again, it's complicated, but we, we kind of split it to where everything is fair. So that's how we do that. We have a herd of older spring calving cows, and then we'll have uh, a herd of one or two herds of younger ones. And then we have the first calf heifers or separate bunch. And uh, then we have a fall calving herd, and then a, a, a of older cows, and then a younger fall calving. It's part of it is because we don't have any one place big enough to hold everything, so mm-hmm. we uh, we have different farms or leased farms and we separate the bunches depending on 
how many this farm will hold. And okay. It's it's really complicated, and fortunately, our, our son Matt, as we grew the operation, uh, fortunately, that's when he, he came on board, and, and of course, his extra numbers complicated things, too, but he is the one that kind of decides where where every who who goes where he he uh, orchestrates all the all the moves and and does the master master planning he he's really good at it uh, he's always even when he was a little kid would would have extensive farms all over his built on his the floor of his of his oh, bedroom yeah. you know and I think that's uh, he probably developed those skills at that point but <laughs> but he's really good at it and Alan and I have decided that he he does it so well we just. I mean, we all communicate, or, or we try to, but what or we talk about, you know, the the plan, what you know, who's going to go where, when, and when the bulls go in, and when the bulls bulls come out, and but he he's the one that that does orchestrate that, so that's mm-hmm. great. So he's got the big overall plan. Yes. Now, what is your part in this big overall? My plan? part, I take care of a couple of herds. I take care of the. The big spring calving herd, that's our biggest herd. and But they're also uh, the easiest as far as problems. They, they have fewer problems than the others. But they also are on the roughest terrain. They, they, they travel <laughs> probably six or seven miles in our rotational loop. And part of that is through the woods, you know, across mm-hmm. the creeks. And, and it's a very interesting operation the way we put that together but it's it's land we own and uh and and adjacent properties that we lease but i take care of that herd which does take quite a bit of time depending on where they are because i have to build a lot of um temporary fence and I, there's a an awful lot of what we call permanent fence to maintain and our permanent fence is is just a pretty much a single strand of 12 and a half gauge high tensile high tensile wire but we have many, 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 many miles of it and, and really rough terrain. So that's my job to, to take care of all that and the cattle. And uh, and then I have a smaller bunch of first calf heifers that I really like because the farm there is very easy and, and they're, they're just pretty sweet. So I enjoy that. So how much time does it take you to do your, your daily work, Tina, of managing all these cattle? Um, what's, in, what's involved? On a daily basis I well my daily routine I, I usually get up and out the door pretty early um, earlier than I would if I wasn't married to Alan I think he's <laughs> he's an early riser but we we like to move the cattle early uh, especially in the summer um, mm-hmm. it gets so hot and then they don't want to move or uh, but I, I like to get out and move them right at daylight so that they can uh, enjoy some cool, cool time to get out and graze, and then they can go to the shade and ruminate. So, uh, but even in the winter, I, 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 that's the first thing I do every day is uh, is go out and move the cows. So I drive to wherever they are, and that that can vary um, depending on on where they are. Sometimes I I just get in my side by side at the house and and go to wherever they are. But sometimes I have to drive you know, three or four miles to, to where I've got a, another side-by-side base to take care of them. But I go out, and the first thing I do is just kind of take a quick look at them. But they're usually, by the time, when they hear my four-wheeler, they, they line up. They know where they're going to move next. And so they're sitting there waiting, looking at their watches. Where have we been? We're starting. <laughs> and so I reel back the fence or open the gate, depending on the situation, and they march through there's so many of them it can take you know five to ten minutes sometimes for them to all get through the the opening and once they're all through um, I'll take up the rest of the fence and then um, I make sure they have water and their mineral just make sure they're secure that my my next fence is in good shape Uh, and then I always build the next day's fence okay so that you have to have that ready for them. When you get there in the morning, they're ready to move, so you have to have that their their next paddock ready or they're going to mm-hmm. be stomping up and down the fence while you're building it. So so we always build the next days ahead. I always like to do that anyway just as a, a precaution in case they somehow so or bust through my fence. Um, you know, just that rarely happens, but if it does, it can really mess up your, your rotational plan because they get out into what you were 
not wanting them to be in the ad. Right. So, and if it's nice weather, often I'll build four or five days worth of paddocks in one day, and that way, if the weather's bad the next day, it doesn't. I'll have to just take down a fence. I don't have to build a new one. Mm-hmm. Or if I want to go kayaking, I can go kayaking. <laughs> and uh, so, it when it's nice weather, I like to get a lot of work done mm-hmm. and then and be ahead. I'm just I like to plan ahead. That takes on that herd maybe probably just an hour to take down a fence and build one new fence and um and then my little bunch I do the same thing there except that it it's so easy it just it takes anywhere from five minutes to to an hour if I'm building quite a bit of fence so So you're moving them every day we move them every day almost without fail the reason we do that is because, well, for one, they're so spoiled, uh, especially that big herd. They, I don't know what they'd do if they didn't get to move every day. Honestly, <laughs> I am not sure. <laughs> In fact, I, there's no telling what they would do. But we, we find that we love being able to ration their pasture. It makes them eat it more uniformly. And we also know, you know, about how many days worth of pasture we have, which when it's raining, it's not a big deal, but... Now that we have a drought, we're um, happy to kind of have a handle on how much more more grass we have. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a control freak, too. I like them to be right where I know they're going to be. I I love to see them in a bunch. When I drive around and look at other people's cattle scattered all over a hillside, I just think, how can they stand that? You know, I I like them confined. But they're not, and they're not crowded. I don't want to give you that idea, but they're, uh, they're just bunched together and, they develop a great herd mentality when they're like that. You know, they, they want to be in that herd, and they move as a herd. If someone gets left behind, they are freaking out. They want to get get back to the herd, and uh, it makes them really easy to handle, very, very easy to handle. Yeah, yeah. I, I can picture them lining up at the fence waiting for you to, to move that fence. I had a question about... How do you know where you're putting that next fence? Are you looking at how short they have? And what kind of residue are you aiming for to leave behind? That was a big question. It's a big question. On our pastures, they are not flat and square and uniform. There there may be, oh, there's oddly shaped. There may be a bunch of woods in the middle. There, it's, it's really a challenge. Part of it is just trial and error, and I'd say that's that's it. I, when I first started doing it, I used to call Matt and, or Alan and I'd say, is this, I don't know what to do. And, and Matt would just say, you just have to do it and just look at what you did. Did you, you know, if they ate it too short, you didn't give them enough, give them more the next time. You know, you just have to learn. And I've been over these same pastures so many times, I kind of have an idea of how many, how 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 much grass to give them. I don't use a stick to measure it. I just, I just kind of eyeball it. And, Mm -hmm. uh, we try to leave again, it just varies, but maybe six inches or Mm -hmm. maybe more. It, it just varies. And Mm -hmm. and sometimes you, you can't, in theory you can do it, but like if there's clover, they're going to eat that into the dirt Mm -hmm. and then the fescue might be a foot tall. You know, it's, you, you can do your best to try to evenly graze it, but, but it depends on the, the time of the year and what kind of grass. But, but we always try to leave a, a good residue. We like to you know not leave any bare spots. We try to, well, for many reasons, just uh, we leave, like to leave enough leaves so that the plants can recover quickly. But then we don't do tight rotations. I, I think on that, that big herd that I'm talking about, we probably make that loop three times a year. So those pastures get quite a bit of rest. That's important. That's important. Yeah. And I, I, I appreciate what you said about you can't really control. Like it never is going to look like it was mowed when you move your animals off. Right. But not letting them have any such a such an impact that they're leaving behind bare ground. That's that's really cool. What what do your animals, how do your animals respond to weeds? To what? Weeds. weeds. Mm-hmm. Oh. Do they graze they, them? Yes, they do. Most, well, a lot of them. There's some they, they won't. Uh, they won't touch Cerisa lespedeza, which it is a terrible 
invasive in my opinion. And people with sheep, I guess, or goats think it's great, but I think it's the scourge of the earth personally. <laughs> um, they, they won't eat that, but they, they will actually eat some of the thistles and they eat ragweed when it's little. And there's a lot of the, oh, one of our landowners could tell you exactly the, all the complicated names for these wildflowers that they, that they eat. But y- yes, they do. They, they, like them and I feel like they get some extra nutrients and minerals from those those plants mm-hmm. because they I've read that they have deep deeper roots and they draw different minerals mm-hmm. into the plant and our, and our, our pastures are very diverse they're not doesn't look like a golf course it, there's a lot of weeds and or wildflowers, if you want to call them that. So, yeah, let's call them that. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we are the friends of the pollinators. Oh, so yeah, that I, I like that. I like to see. I I love that too. I felt like when I saw your farm, it was such a beautiful place. And I I wonder, do you see a lot of wildlife besides pollinators? Do you see? Yeah, we do. We see, um, well, I saw a bear cub the other day. So we see um, a lot of deer, some wild turkeys. Someone saw a mountain lion the other day. So there's there's a lot of wildlife and uh, birds, you know, a lot of birds and and things and I enjoy that I love seeing that and mm-hmm. and I, one of our goals is to improve the the ha- for habitat for the, the wildlife we're, we're looking at trying to develop more silva pasture and doing control burns I would love to see the quail come back oh, that would be, I would too yeah so I would too no that's that's wonderful I I like that you said one of your goals is to improve a habitat do you have more goals that you can can share like uh, for your operation or for your family, something that you... I don't have uh, written goals. I should, I know. <laughs> but I think Al and I have always wanted to um, to have uh, land and, and cattle that we would stay in the family, that the land would stay intact and, and undeveloped. I, mm-hmm. I, uh, that's, that's just a goal of mine. I, I feel like I would like to conserve this contiguous acreage that we have because it's it's unique anymore to find big chunks of land that are not developed and I think that's just important so that that is a goal and I think I've instilled that in our in our sons we I I mentioned our we have a younger son too and he has a tree service and and lives near us and is he loves the land too he's he doesn't love the cattle as much but um he is capable of helping if we if we make him (laughs) But that's that would be a goal, and I love that the lifestyle was not so hideous that the kids, as they were growing up, didn't want to come back and do it. You know, I think that we had enough of a of a qual. I mean, they could see the quality of life living in a rural in, in a rural Arkansas right. on our farm that they chose to come back and live here. And I, I think that's important. I love to keep brain power in the state and, and good people in our oh. neighborhood and. Yes, um, and I'm I'm very proud that that they have chosen to live in Carroll County. That, that's oh. that's important. So that was maybe a secret goal to have them come back here. <laughs> I I feel that. <laughs> Believe me, I feel that. Yeah. Don't have time to stay up to date on the freshest sustainable agriculture news, events, and funding opportunities? You can trust NCAT to keep you connected with our weekly harvest e newsletter. Subscribe today at NCAT.org and get your weekly harvest delivered each Wednesday. That's great. We talked about that your terrain is very varied, and you have mentioned about the electric fence that you maintain, that you use a lot of temporary fence. I feel like a big challenge and a need is for water in all the paddocks, and I'm curious how you provide water to your livestock. We have a lot of different water sources, but I would I would say that our main water source is through wells, and we've developed through the years a, a fairly extensive water system. It's buried so that it doesn't freeze, and we have a lot of those tire tanks mm-hmm. and some other just you know regular tanks. And um, there's a kind of a freeze proof tank. It's an old fashioned type thing, but we mm-hmm. we put several of those in early days and. And we still use those. Those are very effective. The, 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 they're, that's our best system. Most of our land prior to that had no water. And um, 
we after 2012 when we had the drought, we we got really serious about getting water everywhere because we had some ponds and springs and creeks that we had relied on that became unreliable. They dried up, and so we had pasture in some places but no water. And when it's that hot in the summer, they will not walk very far to water. So after that, we decided to get serious, and and we put water systems in where we, you know, so that we would not have to be faced with that situation again. So we all all of our farms that we own, we've got really good water systems on them. So a lot of upfront work that now is paying off and right. making it easier yeah. easier for you yeah. to. And I we have a great backhoe guy and so we hired him and he did the dishes and we would I don't know how many <laughs> lengths of pipe I have hauled on my truck. But we just installed them our, ourselves and did the work ourselves and uh it's really the only way to do that intensive grazing. You've got to have a, a good water system. Mm-hmm. And and it is some work but it's not that formidable. I mean it it's doable for sure. Tina, how did you learn? How to do all of this? The intensive grazing. <laughs> the how did you learn? Years ago, in the oh mid eighties, Alan got interested in it. I think from reading, and then we had a client, Bill Ross, who is like a leader in our area. He's a, a guru, mentor to many, many, many people in our area who wanted to do this. And so Bill, Bill got Alan interested in that, and uh, Alan is a He's a voracious reader and, and a, a lifelong learner, you know, mm-hmm. which is good. But he he started building electric fence and, and doing this rotational grazing. And, and he would move the cattle every morning before going into the clinic. So it, it's not a full-time job. You can you can do this and, and have a full-time job. Or as we had, ours was more than a full-time job. Right. We worked 50 or 60 hours a week at the clinic. So... It, it's definitely doable. You just have to do it. And mm-hmm. uh, um, but we attended Jim Garish and uh, Ron Morrow. This was in the mid mid or late eighties. Had a grazing school up in near Columbia, Missouri, and we attended that. And it was a several day course. And and I learned so much. And after that, I was I was really on board. I understood the, the philosophy or the reasons for doing it and the uh, science behind the it. science behind mm-hmm. it. Yes. And, and it all made so much sense to me as a, I, I guess I am a scientist. And uh, so it, it made perfect sense. And the more I learned through going to other conferences, uh, and you have to be careful what conferences you go to, too. But do you, you want to go to the ones who are sponsored by electric fence companies and maybe maybe seed stock companies? I don't know, but not <laughs> not by chemical dewormer people. But uh, anyway, the, the I think what really turned on the light was learning about soil, about how to take care of the soil. And I think it really is all about the soil. If you can... If you can take care of the soil, the soil will grow the grass, and then the grass will grow the cattle, and mm-hmm. cattle will feed people, and, and it's all about the soil and the, and the sun and the rain, and that was how we learned. Um, we also, there was a, a little group, support group, <laughs> a support group <laughs> of, yeah. uh, of rotational <laughs> graders in, uh, in our area uh, back in the, I don't know, maybe mid to late 80s. I'm not sure when it started. I was not involved. And originally with it, that it was, uh, they called themselves the Grassroots Grazing Group, GGG. And it was farmers from the Northwest Arkansas, uh, Bill Ross and John Spain and uh, Ron, Ron. And Ron and, Morrow. Right. Yeah. And Ann, uh, Ann Wells and, well, Claire Whiteside, she's with NRC, our, our NRCS in the Harrison area. Um, it, just a lot of those people would decided it would be a, a good thing to get together once a month at, at someone's farm. So we call them pasture, they call them pasture walks. And so someone would host a pasture walk and it, it's usually on a Saturday from 10 to 2. And they just walk around and look at people's grass and what they're doing, you know, how they're doing their waters, how they're moving their cattle, but they're, you know, handling facilities, just lots of different different things. But you can share ideas and, and be around 
like-minded, positive thinkers and innovative people. So that's that has been a a, a fun thing and. And now it's uh, it's still going, which is great. And I think COVID put the whammy on it for a while, but we're starting to to meet again and have pastoral walks. And I love that you know there's still uh, us old geezers, but there's uh, still y- younger people are starting to come and, and bring their children. And it, it's just fun. It's fun to see that interest uh, in a younger young, a younger generation is interested in this type of agriculture, sustainable agriculture. Absolutely. And that land stewardship, I'm hearing this through several of the things that you've said about taking care of the soil and, and, and having land that is not developed and, and uh, you know, encouraging wildlife and, and just a beautiful, healthy place that you can leave behind for your sons and, and your grandchildren. And, and that's great. And yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Seeing the young people come to the pasture walks has been super fun and they can learn from you and your experience and, and others. And, and that's good. We pass it down. Just like you learned from Bill Ross. It's, it's a good time to teach. Yeah. What kind of impacts have you seen on your farms? Cause you've been managing for some years now this way. Have you noticed changes in your soils and in your pastures? Oh, d- definitely. Cause through the years, we've acquired properties that have been continuously grazed or um, have really poor soils. In, in fact, the one I mentioned that I enjoy so much, it's it's a 75 acres. And when we bought it, it had been continuously grazed for, for years. And uh, we, when we first started running cattle on it, I, I think it would, maybe 20 head of cattle was all we could keep on it. And now, I, I've had as many as... I think 38 cow-calf pairs on it. But just by just simply doing the rotational grazing and, and letting the plants rest, we this, the soil develops to get organic material in it, uh, plant diversity. So uh, we have cool season grasses, warm season grasses. We haven't seeded anything. It just, it's in, the seeds are in the soil bank. And if you just give them a chance, yes. they'll come you know it's like if you just rest it it will come and so that is fun to see the development of that and uh, we we don't do a lot of soil testing or check check organic matter but I I feel certain that it's got to be greatly improved Mm -hmm. and uh, but one for instance we had one place that it was a wooded 40 acres that we actually cleared and started you know which is I know that's probably the worst thing to do to to soil us to just clear it, but we cleared it and seeded it, and uh, and then we've just done rotational grazing on it for I don't know fifteen or twenty years, and uh, we had to have a, a road built through there uh, just on top of the ridge, and the guys that came with their little bulldozer to scrape the dirt off so they could get down to you know the rockiness and and then haul in a little bit of gravel. They couldn't believe how much topsoil there was. I mean, they were just dumbfounded with the amount of topsoil on that ridge because they do that kind of dozing all over the county and they just were astonished and, you know, I think it made believers out of them to, to see how our system benefits the soils. Um, That's, that has to be so satisfying. Yeah, it was, it was fun oh, to yeah. see, really. And then uh, now that with the drought, I, I feel like, too, there's a, a benefit in that the plants have you know, the deeper root systems mm-hmm. and, and there's... The, the ground is covered. Um, sometimes we will brush hog after the cattle graze when, it, you know, the, we'll knock down some of the stems or the tall fescue, but we haven't done that. This year we've kept it, you know, so it'll shade and, uh, and they actually will come back and eat those seeds too. But, but it's, I think it has benefited us in a, a drought. You know, I feel like we, we have fairly, a fairly good amount of grass. I mean, it's just standing hay, but at least there's something for them to eat. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're just taking it down, you know, about halfway and, and moving them pretty fast. And, and I, I feel like if we get a decent rain, it'll just come back quickly. It'll recover very quickly. I oh, think. I, I hope so. And I, and I pray that we get rain soon. I know they're calling this, for it. So I, I hope they I are hope just so. teasing us. This long stretch of 100 degree plus days has, and the hot, dry wind has really taken a, a toll, I know, on my farm. 
and the Cerisa Lespedeza is still green. That's all. Uh, that's, that's all I can really say for it. They still don't really want to eat it, but yeah. it is still green. <laughs> Tina, what advice do you have for others? And I'm thinking here specifically of women who want to do what you do. What kind of advice? Well, do you um, have? I think this type of of handling of cattle is very much geared to women. I'm not saying we're we're weak or anything like that, but it's just so easy. The building the fence is easy. Even the well, what we call permanent fence is is just that strand of a twelve gauge wire. But even that is, it's just so easy and inexpensive. And then the the temporary fences that you build off of that using the poly wire are super easy to build. And uh, so it, from one thing, I mean that it's just easy. It doesn't require a lot of equipment, um, a lot of strength, and by Moving the cattle every day, they become so gentle and so easy to handle that like, if I ever need to get one in a corral, I can usually either drive her or just uh, build a lane of poly wire and you know, just uh, easily get her to a corral for help just all by myself. And so that, that part makes it where women could easily do that. And I, I like working by myself. I enjoy the, the solitude. I like being with the animals, and I like being out in nature. I, I love just uh, seeing the sunrise or, you know, watching watching a cow calf. <laughs> I find that all very satisfying. And I think it's, it's just a good way of life. It's a, I feel like I have a, a great quality of life. I do. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for that. You had said somewhere in our conversation that your, your son told you to just do it. And I like oh. that. I like that. I feel like learn all you can. Would you agree with this? I learn. Yes. Learn all you can, but then try. Try it. And also, I would highly recommend finding a mentor. Just you can learn a lot from them. Just learn the day-to-day mechanics. And that will give you a lot of confidence, mm-hmm. too. Uh, you know, you might know in your had the theory of doing it, but actually getting out and doing it, it's, it isn't hard, but if you could just follow someone around, shadow them for a couple of days, just, mm-hmm. just to learn the mechanics of it, just little tricks. And, you know, I, I could tell you a million things what not to do. And, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, and I just learned by trial and error. I would love to help someone avoid a lot of the stupid things I've done. Uh, so Hey, I appreciate that offer. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you're welcome to come. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, to share whatever I know, and, and it and it's, may not be the, the right way to do it, but it works for me. And, mm-hmm. uh, so. and over the years, you've learned a lot of low-cost ways to solve problems. I'm hearing you say this, and so thank you for sharing. I appreciate you coming and sharing with our class, with Women, Livestock, and the Land. It was so wonderful to have you there to like help encourage everyone and teach them your tricks with the electric fence on the hands on. Thank you for helping me with my electric fence (laughs) and my tractor driving. I just really appreciate the way you are because I feel you are a confidence builder yourself in just how you approach everyone. So thank you for that. Any final words before we sign off? Not final words. I don't mean that. (laughs) Any advice for others? I heard you say get a mentor. I think that's really important. I I think that would be good. And I I would have to say my my mentors were Alan and uh, and then later Matt. Uh, You know, he he's the reluctant mentor, but uh, but he he will grudgingly give advice sometimes. Um, But I I think you can just learn a lot from someone else and. But then again, you just, you have to just do it. Mm-hmm. You, you have to make mistakes and you're going to make mistakes as long as, you know, you don't want to try to make, I mean, try not to make huge mistakes, but you want to learn, you just have to learn by doing. You have, that's, yes. that's what I did. I mean, I knew the theory and I watched and had someone, you know, kind of look, look out for what I was doing, but, but the, you just have to do it. And but having a mentor would give you a little more confidence, I think. Yeah, just having somebody you can check in with. Yes, I I agree with you. Mentors are super valuable. Well, Tina, thank you so much for this conversation and for being here. And uh, 
and for the great example that you've led. And I hope that you continue to have a wonderful time and plenty of time for kayaking. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks. Oh, before we sign off, though, I ought to say, NCAT has a project that is right down your alley because Soil for Water, and you can find that link at soilforwater.org, is all about producers helping other producers to learn ways to manage their soil so that, as Tina was saying, when it rains, we can keep the rain in our soil, we can grow more forage, we can keep our animals and our land healthier. So to learn more, go to soilforwater.org and I encourage you to join the network and the forum and share your questions and your successes and your tips on that forum. We would, we would love to have you. So thank you very much. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. Additional information about this episode and related resources can be found at atra.incat.org. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Voices from the Field wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Rich Myers. ATRA, Voices from the Field, is produced by the National Center for Appropriate Technology, headquartered in Butte, Montana. It's supported by the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service as part of NCAT's ATRA Sustainable Agriculture Program. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this recording are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the USDA or NCAT. We'll catch you again next week, and until then, keep on farming.